protected mountain ranges extend throughout the greater part of the interior of Central America. Most of the people prefer to live in these highlands, and they have settled wherever it is possible to farm, or wherever there is land suitable for grazing. The advantages they find here include a comfortable climate and soil made fertile by the ash of many volcanoes. Some of the disadvantages include those same volcanoes. The fact that there are so many people living here and the difficulties of mountain transportation. The highland backbone extends more than 1,000 miles from Mexico into South America and composes at least a part of each of the countries of Central America, which are British Honduras and the republics of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. How do the people make use of the advantages and cope with the disadvantages of the highlands? Let's begin with transportation. The rugged mountains present many obstacles to travel. The countries are poor, and the mountain highways are expensive to build, and rainy weather may make them unusable. To cross the mountains, railroads must span deep ravines. Almost every mile of track requires the construction of trestles and tunnels, so rail travel is available in only a few areas, and many towns have no railroad. Because of the difficulties of ground travel, air transportation is very important in Central America. In Guatemala, most cargo destined for remote mountain villages is shipped by air. And travelers often depend upon commercial pilots such as Carlos Blanco to get them to out of the way places. Carlos is taking off from Guatemala City, heading for Indian villages in northern Guatemala. Flying northwest, the plane passes over beautiful Lake Atitlan. The lake, lying among cone-shaped volcanoes, is a major tourist attraction. The sounds of the marimba may be heard from lakeshore resorts. The marimba is Guatemala's national instrument. The players are Indian. The pilot's destination is a dirt landing strip deep in the mountain area. The flight takes 45 minutes. It would have taken these people three days to make this same trip over the mountain roads. Without the airplane to bring people, medical supplies, and trade goods, the Indians in this area would live in near isolation. About two-thirds of the people in Guatemala are Indian farmers. These are Maya Indians. Their nearby village is one of thousands of villages in the mountains, made more colorful by the typical Indian dress. Life in these mountain areas has changed little throughout the years. All villagers get their drinking and cooking water from the village well and carry it home on the... Indian girls begin at an early age to share their mother's daily tasks. Clothes are washed by hand in the village's newly constructed community laundry. An Indian baby is wrapped in blankets and carried on his mother's back while she works. It's a little bumpy at times and tends to disturb a good nap. Using the same type of loom their ancestors did, the Indians weave the cloth from which the family's clothes are made. These children, like 70% of the people in Guatemala, cannot read or write. The government wants all children to be educated, but schools are few and many Indian children learn only the skills taught by their parents. Indian farmers live in the villages and go out to their farms each day. Each farm is small, for this is one of the most heavily populated rural areas in the world. 
Using a stick, a farmer plants the ancient Indian crops, corn and beans. He is able to raise only enough to feed his family, with perhaps a little left over for trading. Once a week, on market day, they come down the mountain trails toward the nearest town, bringing their livestock, farm goods, and handicrafts. The women bring vegetables and handcrafted items they hope to sell or to trade. The marketplace is their shopping center. It also serves as a weekly gathering place for the exchange of gossip and for local celebrations. Vegetables, fruit, and other products are displayed and sold by the farm families and craftsmen who produce them. Life in even the most remote mountain village is slowly being changed by air travel. Passengers often include religious leaders, teachers, and businessmen. The Maya farmers will seldom leave their cornfields, but the cargo includes many of their handcrafts being shipped to city markets. It takes great skill for Carlos Blanco to fly in the rugged country of Guatemala, but such air travel is common between all Central American countries. It is only a short flight from Guatemala to San Salvador, the capital city of El Salvador. The term crowded highlands aptly describes El Salvador. The entire nation is only 160 miles long and 60 miles wide, yet some two and a half million people live within its borders. The major city, San Salvador, is changing so rapidly that the slum dwelling and newly constructed building often exist side by side. And a modern hotel stands beside a field where oxen are still being used for plowing. The people are mostly mestizos, that is, of mixed Spanish and Indian blood, as are 85% of the people in Central America. Providing jobs and income for its crowded population is the greatest problem facing this small republic. It has rural populations as high as 500 people per square mile, so individual farms are small. A few wealthy people live in large haciendas and own most of the land suitable for coffee and cotton plantations. While the vast majority are crowded into poor villages and the slum areas of the city. The government has built new apartment areas and is trying to solve its job problems with more industry. Under the Central America Common Market Plan, El Salvador will be able to refine oil for other countries. And it is building new factories to produce goods that can be sold duty-free in the Central American markets. The neighboring republic, Honduras, is larger and more sparsely settled, yet it is behind El Salvador in many ways. Although there are many mineral resources in the highlands of Honduras, they remain underdeveloped. The capital city, Tegucigalpa, is located in a high mountain valley. The early Spanish conquerors found the Indians mining silver here. They took over the mines and made Tegucigalpa a colonial city. Although most of the people today are mestizos, the largest industries and most of the property is owned by people whose ancestors were pure Spanish. The Spanish architecture in Tegucigalpa and the cobblestone streets still show the colonial influence. As is true in most of the highlands, the people adhere to the Catholic faith introduced by the Spanish missionaries. Honduras differs too in that more of its land is at higher elevations than that of El Salvador, for example. Most of the cities and farms we have seen in Guatemala and El Salvador are located in the Tierra Templata zone, which lies from about 2,000 to 6,000 feet above sea level. In the Tierra Templata, there is plenty of rain and the temperature is moderate. It is fine for growing crops such as corn and beans. And it is the zone where most of Central America's coffee plantations are located. The next higher zone is the Tierra Fria, or cool weather land. 
Although Honduras is in the tropics, its high cool Tierra Fria areas are forested with oak and pine trees. And farmers in this zone grow wheat, potatoes and other cool weather crops similar to those in the United States. Here on the high meadows, Indians herd flocks of sheep and goats. And large areas of the fertile highlands are used for the grazing of cattle. Often leaving only the steep slopes and rocky hillsides for the Indian and mestizo farmers who raise their own food. This is one of the most common problems in the highlands the farmer without enough land or tools to grow a profitable crop. Leaving Honduras, the main air route south follows the mountain ranges over Nicaragua to Costa Rica. The plains fly near cones that are part of a chain of volcanoes stretching along the Pacific side of the highlands. The great coffee farms are primarily located along these western highlands, where the ash and lava deposited by volcanoes has weathered into a very rich soil. Most Central American coffee trees require the protective shade of larger trees. The coffee berries grow in clusters along the branches. They are picked when they turn red in the dry season. Coffee pickers are paid according to the amount of coffee they pick. In harvest season, entire families often go to work on the plantation. The owner or farm manager weighs their pick and pays them for the day's work. The coffee berries resemble cherries, except that the valuable part is the two coffee beans inside. The berries are transported to one of the many processing plants and dumped into the collecting room. From there they go through a machine that takes the coffee beans out of the berries. Then the beans are moved through a water trough out to the drying beds. Here they are spread out on the concrete beds to dry in the sun. Workers rake them to make sure they dry evenly. The beans are divided and placed in various drying beds according to quality. Great care is taken throughout the process because coffee is Central America's most important product. The dried beans are sacked and this is the way most coffee is sold for export. The buyer for a coffee company judges the quality of the coffee by the weight and feel of it in his hands. Most of the better quality coffee from Centrica is exported to the United States. For the most part, plantation owners are people of Spanish descent, and the workers are mestizo or Indian. An exception is Costa Rica, where there were never many Indians, and the Spanish settled on farms of a size they could work themselves. These middle-class families, neither very rich nor very poor, have helped give Costa Rica a stable economy. Most of the Spanish people of Costa Rica live in the capital city, San Jose, or farm the volcanic soil of the interior plateaus and slopes. Through many centuries, volcanoes in Costa Rica deposited the ash and lava that gave the nation its rich highland soil. On volcanic slopes and basins, the people grow their coffee, cotton, sugarcane, and other cash crops. San Jose is located in a region of volcanoes. Its people are accustomed to the occasional eruptions and earthquakes common to all of the highland countries. Old volcanoes are the source of much of their agricultural prosperity. As a result, the majority of people in San Jose live comfortably and have an adequate supply of food. The Costa Ricans are the best educated people in Central America. Their National University, the National Palace of Fine Arts, 
many attractive churches and public buildings are typical of their cultural interests. But recently, volcanic eruption has threatened much of this peaceful atmosphere. A volcano can be a menace as well as an asset. In 1963, the volcano Irasu near San Jose began pouring forth great clouds of ash. The billowing ash is carried out over the countryside by the prevailing winds. As the ash settles on the land, it leaves a barren waste where the fallout is heavy. In nearby villages, the people are thankful for the days when the dark cloud does not blow in their direction. Because the fine gritty dust is dangerous to breathe and irritating to the eyes. The dust is everywhere underfoot and seeps into homes and stores. These sweepers collected a truckload of ash in just two city blocks. When it rains, the ash pours down the slopes as mud, which the people shovel from their homes in an effort to save them. Despite the uncertainty in Costa Rica, construction of new industries and new schools goes on. And the Costa Ricans continue with their daily tasks, hoping that the forces which helped create their fertile highlands will not destroy them. All of the highland countries in Central America have some of these advantages and disadvantages in common. The assets of comfortable climate and rich volcanic soil the problems of living in rugged mountain country, of overpopulation of farmland, and the crowded conditions among the people in the cities. But they are making progress, and modern transportation is speeding up the flow of trade goods, as symbolized by the volcano and the airplanes, old problems and new opportunities are both a part of life in the highlands of Central America.